Thank you. Uh, thanks, Amos. And I just want to say thank you to Practical Farmers of Iowa for giving me this opportunity. Um, it's an organization I've been a member of for a number of years now, and it's a great organization. So um, thank you for all the work that you do. Uh, I'm the owner of Clear Creek Land and Livestock here in central Nebraska. It's a diversified farming and ranching operation. Uh, I raise uh, certified organic uh, grain crops, uh, livestock, wheat, hay, cover crops. Uh, my entire land base is certified organic. Uh, it's pretty much evenly divided between irrigated crop land uh, and native pastures. Um, and much of those native pastures are actually what we would, you would call virgin prairie. Uh, I just want to say that, you know, you're going to hear about my experiences and my philosophies from a farmer's perspective. I'm not a soil scientist, I'm not a range management technician. So, uh, you know, my experience is going to be different than what some of you ha have, have experienced, but uh, hopefully you can uh, learn something from, from some of my uh, experience. I started out on the farm at a young age. I started working when I was six or seven years old. Dad gave me my first cow when I was when I was 10 years old and I started building a cow herd. And when I was in high school, I bought my first farm, a quarter section, 160 acres of uh, native grassland. I paid two hundred twenty seven dollars an acre for it. Um, you know, it was a lot of money in those days, but and I should have bought more, but I didn't have a lot of money laying around when I was 16, 17 years old. So, but anyway, uh, uh, you know, at an early age, I was placed in a position where I was out on a th Honda three wheeler checking cattle in the native range land most of the summer uh, during vacation and uh, checking cattle, riding fences, looking at the grass, those kinds of things. And, you know, back in those days, we didn't have cell phones. So I wasn't distracted by things like Facebook and TikTok and uh, texted my friends. So I did a lot of, of observation and you know, I paid a lot of attention to what was going on around me in terms of, you know, the, the animals and, and the land and, and the weather patterns and those kind of things. Although being a young teenager, I, I did have a few distractions. I got really good at riding wheelies and jumping terraces with that three wheeler. So, you know, I, I try to make things fun out here and, um, but, uh, you know, still, it's a business. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, you know, my dad, fortunately, my dad was very progressive. We, we were started doing amp grazing and rotating cattle uh, back in around 1972. And we had uh, one place where there was 11 quarter sections of uh, pasture that was all contiguous. We rotated cattle through there. And nobody was doing that back then in this area. So, you know, we were the first ones. And and that was about the time my father sold his veterinary practice and we were farming and ranching full time. Uh, so and then, you know, I finished high school, went to college, eventually went to graduate school. I worked for the USDA for a few years and then I worked at several universities. And then 30 years ago, I left uh, a prominent position at the University of Massachusetts, felt drawn back to the farm. I guess I decided that I that I wanted to be a farmer uh, for the rest of my life. And I came back and, and uh, started farming. Dad rented me 500 acres of uh, the crop ground and I started raising corn and, and alfalfa. And it didn't take very long. Like a pretty disillusioned with that. You know, I didn't feel like it was what I signed up for. I wanted, I thought I would be an independent businessman, but I quickly realized after selling corn for $1.70 a bushel and hay for $30 a ton that, you know, that I was just making enough money to farm another year. And I started to question, you know, is that really a privilege or is it because it seemed a lot more like punishment? Um, so uh, um, I decided that, uh, um, you know, I was just beholden to all these large, I was just a surf on the land, beholden to all these large egg conglomerates selling me all these inputs, promising that they were going to help me make a lot more money, but that wasn't the case. It, it never worked out that way. So I decided I needed to start moving in a different direction. So, or else maybe get out of farming altogether. So around 2002, 
uh, I made a decision along with my rest of the family that um, I was going to kick all the Monsatans to the curb. And I stopped using chemicals and fertilizers. We stopped using them on all 2,800 acres that we had. So, and I don't recommend that everybody do it quite abrupt that abruptly, but you know, it worked for us. Um, you know, about, and people were telling me then, well, you can't grow good crops without using chemicals and fertilizers. Well, I've been told a lot of things I couldn't do in life uh, growing up and, 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 as, and as a farmer, um, you can't finish cattle on grass and produce high quality beef. Well, I finished several thousand head of cattle uh, on grass and produce really high quality beef. So you know, I kind of like proving people wrong, but you can see here in a, in a slide some of our organic crops um, without using any soil amendments, any chemicals or fertilizers. Um, so, you know, it's, I'm not saying it's easy, but if I can do it, so can a lot of other people. Um, at the, at the, and at about that same time, I started, uh, transitioning a lot of the, uh, cropland back to grass so I could finish those cattle on irrigated pastures and, uh, um, you know, and that was certainly more profitable. Grazing was more profitable than raising corn or soybeans or hay or anything else. And at the peak, I had uh, 1,800 head of cattle on those 2,800 acres, all running on grass, 500 head of sheep and goats, and 400 laying hens that we were pulling in a mobile chicken trailer behind the, the cattle. Um, and those were much higher numbers than anybody else was running on those that number of acres. So um, and we'll talk a little bit more later about how we were able to do that. But everything out here is pasture based. I mean, I've never owned a feed truck. I've never owned a feed bunk. So I don't ever keep animals in, in confinement and, and feed them, uh, you know, grain, they all graze. And at that time I was getting, for the grass fed beef, I was getting about double the price of commodity fat cattle. So that was working pretty good, but then eventually they did away with country of origin labeling and they started bringing importing a lot of grass-fed beef and those premiums diminished so we started transitioning some of that land back to uh and raising certified organic grains and that's been very profitable for us and it's spread out the, the risk and, and, and diversified us a little bit more so it's been a good thing uh transitioning kind of back in that uh direction but the main point i want to make is that our main focus is profitability. I mean, this isn't just a lifestyle for me. Uh, what I do out here has to be profitable. And, um, you know, without that, you know, nothing else really matters. Uh, and the bankers, they always want, they always want money. They don't care about pounds or bushels or soil health or anything like that. They want their payments. They want money. And uh, farming is my only source of income. So this has to work for me. If it doesn't, then, you know, I probably end up living in a van down by the river, eating government cheese. And there are days when that seems like maybe a better option, but at least for now, I want to continue to do what I'm doing. So, so we, we're, we're very focused on profitability. Um, you know, but the good news is that, uh, you know, regenerative farming methods and grazing, they could be highly congruent with high profit levels, uh, you know, using the right approach. Um, and you can do that farming hundreds of acres instead of thousands of acres because the, the conventional thinking is horizontal expansion. Okay, if we, we are not making that much money, so we've got to have more acres. So we rent or buy more land. And, you know, then you have a philosophy where it becomes more important to have your neighbor's land than it is to have your neighbor. And, uh, you know, we've kind of done the opposite here. I like having my neighbors around and I don't really want more land. I can uh, look more at vertical expansion and what's really worked best for us in a nutshell is to decrease input expenses. In fact, even eliminate some of the inputs and on the market end, add value. If you can do that, you can be highly profitable. Um, next, uh, let's, let's go to the next slide. I'm not sure what, I don't remember what we had. Okay. This kind of is what I, talked about earlier when you know we've been told that we can't do a lot of different things but 
this is one of my favorite quotes. And I live by this because I can't tell you how many things I've done out here that people told me couldn't, I couldn't do. Um, that's a reflection on their limitations, not mine. And that goes back to my, you know, 27 years as a competitive weightlifter goes throughout my, all my farming career been told you can't do this. You can't do that. Well, I want you to just ignore the naysayers and uh, don't put, you know, strict limitations on what you're doing. Uh, let's talk, uh, start talking about establishing native, native perennials. Uh, I think the first question you need to ask is why? What, what's your goal? I mean, pretty much with anything you do out here, but and, and the same with establishing native perennials. Uh, what's your motive? Um, is it you want to improve soil health? You want to prevent erosion? You're going to use it primarily for grazing. Is it a prairie restoration project where you want to use only natives? Uh, is it used for wildlife or hunting or, or maybe possibly buffer strips down through your uh, some of your crop fields to attract beneficial insects and birds and those kind of things? Or is it uh, um, maybe a lawn, a huge lawn that you want to put back so you don't have to mow it and, uh, you know, a low input sustainable lawn system? It's a lot of different reasons. And, and I will just say that I wouldn't get too caught up in being, a, especially if you're doing it for, for grazing, don't get too caught up in being just a purist. We're like, oh, we're only going to use natives. Um, there's nothing wrong with having a combination of native species and non-natives. And that's what we have on some of our ground. And um, so, you know, and, and are you trying to opt, especially if you're trying to optimize it for grazing livestock, I think you need to pick the best species. And uh, so, yeah, one of the goals is to build a year round forage chain. That's one of our goals anyway. Um, and, uh, you know, we use a lot of different, different, uh, uh, approaches to that, uh, a lot of different types of forages, I should say, uh, cover crops, native grasses, irrigated pasture, grazing crop residues. Um, that upper right picture is cattle grazing in early spring out on corn stalks. There, you can't really see the stalks much anymore, but but they're eating those and grazing that rye, saving me at that time. I was saving about four hundred dollars a day in hay costs, um, and that adds up. You know, we do that for a hundred some days. That lower left, there's that's 500 head on five acres. So just an example of high stock density and that's on an irrigated pivot. The lower right would be grazing in the fall and late fall on uh, native pastures. And you can kind of see the differences in the landscape. I have some really high, highly fertile ground in the Clear Creek Valley. And then we have, uh, native pastures in on the hilly areas in the Lus Hills. Um, so, you know, there's some different types of ecosystems here and we try to match up the resources accordingly. Um, so I think what it's really important is building a forage chain. And, uh, um, you know, so uh, for us that those perennials creates a low input system and it stockpiles well, it tolerates high impact with high stock density. And it's a great environment for summer calving. Go to the next slide. I think I maybe have some examples of, oh, that's just a really nice view of from my front yard. Uh, virgin Prairie, as far as I can see to the north and to the east, that's, that's my views. Um, it's no different now, much different anyway than it was, you know, hundreds or even several thousand years ago. And I enjoy that view because I get, well, no offense to any of you that live east of here, but as I drive east and all I ever see is corn and soybeans, kind of, I, I really appreciate when I come back home. Um, <laughs> so uh, anyway, um, and I was going to also mention, you know, talking about native species, I was doing some, some reading on the internet just recently, and there are, this has kind of surprised me, there are over 1,500 species. Uh, native species of plants here in Nebraska. And I'm sure we have at least several hundred of those on my farm. So there's a lot of different plants to choose from if you're trying to establish. Um, anyway, let's go to the uh, next. Just a little bit more. That photo on the left is uh, 
don't know if anybody knows what that is, but that's lead plant, also known as buffalo bellows or prairie shoestring. That's a native lagoon that's in the pea family. And the indigenous, indigenous tribes use that for medicinal purposes, but it's, you know, it fixates nitrogen. That middle picture, you can see that big roughed out area that had to be from when the lust blew in here and, the, and the, maybe the, the bison rubbed into that side of that hill and the wind. So it's probably a combination of wind erosion and animal impact, but we still see that out here. Upper right there, that's an old buffalo wall on our place. Uh, that you know where water stands nowadays because they they kind of wallowed that out. I still I see prairie chickens almost every day, and a lot of times I see them, you know, groups of 40, 50, 60 at a time. I also have uh, sharp-tailed grouse, and they do their their booming grounds and their uh, mating rituals. And about the, actually about this time of year, I can go out and watch them, and that's quite a sight to see. And you know, it's things like that that kind of really kind of make your day. Um, you can go on to the next slide. I'm going to talk a little bit about human disruption and um, which, you know, continues on today with our farming practices. But uh, you, the two photos on the left, show, one's a close up, one's farther away. It's an old sod dugout site where one of the early homesteaders came in here and built a sod dugout and hunkered down and tried to make a living and, and lay claim to the land. And some, you know, probably less than I guess less than half of them were successful. They, they, it was a tough way to make a living. On the right, there's my daughter standing in, in an old uh, wagon trail, and there's quite a few of those on the place. Um, and sometimes when we graze down, that was pretty severely grazed, and that was intentional. Um, but those things sort of start to stand out a little bit more. Um, go to the next slide. <sighs> Some of that land was plowed hundreds of 100 plus years ago when the homesteaders, they were doing what, what we're trying to do today, is make a living out here. And they had to raise some crops to feed their livestock uh, on their homestead claims. And, and you can still see the remnants of those of where they plowed many, many years later. And sometimes it kind of comes out even when, when you get a little bit of snow, but those are different locations. That one on the right is down in a, in a draw. And you know, the grass is different there. Um, so it still has an effect. I mean, when you start to disrupt native virgin prairie, you're never going to get it back exactly the same way it was. And maybe that's not all bad, but uh, you just have to um, kind of recognize that and go to the next slide. Yeah, that's just wanted to point out that we're in the central Lus Hills region. It's about... Uh, um, 3.6 million acres and about 60% of that is grass. Now, if you go to the, up to the up to just north and west of me, about 50 miles, you get into the Sand Hills region and that's a completely different ecosystem. So my point being is that this stuff is, is very, uh, you know, dependent on geographics and, and your environment. So what might work the species and the type of uh, grazing we do here is going to be different what they do in other regions. And uh, that Sandhills region, that's the largest sand, uh, sand dune deposit in the Western hemisphere, 20,000 square miles, covers uh, a fourth of the state of Nebraska. And, uh, you know, the, the unfair advantage we have out here is, uh, is water. We have more miles of river than any other state. We have more groundwater probably than any other state. We sit over the deepest parts of the Ogallala Aquifer and the sand hills that they dig a post hole, they'll hit water a lot of times in a lot of places. That's not an exaggeration. Um, uh, but anyway, uh, and up in the sand hills, they, they will run cattle on native grass year round. Um, so that their forage chain is dependent on primarily just one thing and uh, native grasses. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about, you know, as far as establishing uh, native grasses. Um, the best thing to, is if you can rejuvenate. Uh, let's go to the next slide. If you can rejuvenate existing native grass, and that's what these pictures represent. Uh, that was virgin prairie. All these pictures are in, are in uh, and we just with high stock density, we sort of rejuvenated. We, we were able to um, let those grasses thrive on the left. That's a big blue stem. And, and then in the middle there, that's sort of several different kinds of grass. Uh, upper right is my daughter standing in, that's Indian grass. 
down below the kids are stand, my kids are standing in uh, uh, switchgrass. So those are our predominant uh, grasses here. We are in a mixed grass prairie, meaning we have short grass species and tall grass species. We're in that transition zone. Uh, you know, buffalo grass would be our major short grass in this area. Um, little blue stem is kind of in between. Uh, it grows a little tall, quite a bit taller than buffalo grass, but not nearly as tall as the big blue stem. So we have, you know, a lot of different kinds of, of grasses, but um, they really exploded that year. We, we did some really high stock density, pretty severe grazing, and then we rested for about 90 days, and that was the result. So grasses, and, and nobody around here has grass like that. Um, so well, let's go to the next slide. You know, animal impact is essential, which what I just mentioned, and, and uh, just, just kind of show some of the results here that one and, and my kids <laughs> with their lean on or spades there you know we do some biological control of invasives uh primarily thistles uh uh invasive thistles we don't do anything with the native thistles um and also we chop out some the cedar trees go to the next slide just more pictures of uh on the left there that's a close-up of that lead plant that's it. I mentioned earlier, it's in the pea family. Um, in the middle there, you see some clovers and alfalfas in the, nat in the native grass. And some of that we've established just with feeding uh, hay, alfalfa or, or, or hay that has clover in it that's mature. So there's plenty of seed. Upper left, or I mean, upper right, there is, uh, that's just the clover in our fields. And if you look there, you can, in the distance there in the upper left, you can see a, a roadway. And then on the other side of that road, that's the neighbors and there's, there's hardly any clover there because most people around here routinely spray their pastures with herbicides. We haven't done that for 20 some years. Um, just more clover in the bottom and that makes the best honey you've ever tasted. And we have bees on the farm too, so. Um, so anyway, I, I, what I was saying is that you know, it's best if you can rejuvenate existing pa perennial pastures uh, using planned grazing, um, but a lot of times you, you, you may need to establish uh, a, a native pasture. And we've done that over the years on probably about 300 acres. And a lot of that, or most all of it, actually went into the CRP program uh, initially. And then it's all come out and, you know, we're grazing it now. But that brings up another point that, you know, there are programs out there through the NRCS, USDA, um, that will help cost share on a lot of that. So that's something to look at. I mean, we've used that to, to our advantages, uh, equip program, conservation stewardship programs. Um, some people, I know some people are opposed to letting, you know, the USDA get involved and that's fine. It's, it's not, you know, it's optional, but uh, just want to make that uh, point. Let's go to the next slide. Oh yeah, I love this slide. <laughs> so, well, first of all, that's the, 465 expressway that borders the east side of my farm there i took that at uh, peak rush hour traffic um but anyway the, the real point i want to make here is my farm is on the right and the neighbors on the left and you can see all the sweet clover uh, and the funny thing was that the owner on the left she asked me uh, about the same time i took this photo she says i want to know what you're spraying on your pastures to get that kind of growth and and, and I, you know, I had to break the news to her. I said, it's not really what I'm spraying because we've never applied any soil amendments or anything. Um, I said, it's what I'm not spraying that makes the difference. And of course we're doing amp grazing and, and she's doing set stock grazing. They, they dump cattle in the first of May and pull them out in October, give them the whole entire pasture. That makes a huge difference. But also, you know, the, oh, you know, the use of herbicides on a routine basis, it, it kills all the broadleaf plants that, that are highly nutritious to ruminant animals. So anyway, uh, let's go to the next slide. Remember what that is. We've done some with multi-species grazing. Uh, that one on the left, that's sheep and goats mixed together and we're holding them in with, in places, single wire, hot wire or two wires. Again, they told me that couldn't be done either, but it can. Um, uh, the upper right there, that's about, there's about 500 head of sheep grazing on that native pasture. And, and so, so we've run cattle and sheep and goats 
um, across this landscape. And, and, and there's tremendous advantages to having multi-species. I don't have, I just have cattle now. And it's not because I don't like the smaller ruminants, but I'm older and I don't have enough, there's much help around nowadays. So we kind of had to, you know, phase some of that out. Let's go to the next slide. Just an example of, of summer calving there uh, on native pasture and, and uh, um, let's go to the next slide. High stock density grazing, that's the key to all this. Um, you can see on the, up, the left side there, those cattle are ready to be moved into the next paddock and, and down in the lower, uh, that one where they're really bunched together really tight, that's a million pounds of beef per acre. And we don't do that only on an experimental uh, situation like that, just to see what it was like. But we have in the past done multiple daily moves, um, but we also do a lot of rotations where the, we move them once a week. Uh, you know, it may not be ideal, but, you know, as those of you that are farmers and ranchers, you know, most everything you do out here is not under ideal conditions. There's a lot of different factors that lower right hand side that's about 300 head on about three acres of irrigated pasture but um let's go to the next slide quite a co contrast here that's a native pasture we're trying to suppress the brome and the other cool season grasses so that it will allow those native warm seasons to, to flourish and so you have to get in early and and knock those back and you know people cuss the brome but and, and it's very invasive but at the same time it, it offers a lot of good early season grazing but you got to get in there and be able to manage it so there's some challenges with that but um so it's all about you know our, our grazing program and um getting back to you know well let's go to the next slide and Yeah, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here. I want to go back to establishing native grasses. Um, you know, the first thing you need to do if, if you're going to take a, say, cropland back to to native grasses, which we've done, and this this is the field where we've done that, actually. You can see the that was done about 40 years ago, but you can still see where we drilled. I mean, you can see the, the rows and stuff um, through that snow. But you need to reduce the weed seed bank. You need to have a good, firm seed bank uh, or seed bed. And you can't plant those seeds more than about an eighth to a fourth of an inch deep. And you gotta have adequate moisture, which I know that's a challenge at times. So you try to plan where if you think you're gonna get some moisture, um, you know, get in and get it planted. And, and then you can plant a lot of different times of the, of the year. I mean, early spring uh, and even in the summer or in the fall. And it kind of depends on where you're at, what the climate is, you know, what your situation is. Um, there's a lot of great resources online extension related and NRCS that can give you some guidelines to your area uh, on how to best do that. It's important to have, you know, a good diverse seed mix. I mean, I think you need probably 10 or 15 species and minimum, you can do a lot more than that. And, and I think you need to have a combination of sod forming grasses and bunch grasses. And we do have that in these, and you can see some examples of that. Um, and also to have legumes, you know, a pasture with 30% legumes is the equivalent of applying 200 pounds of commercial N, commercial nitrogen in split applications throughout the grazing season. That's huge, a huge savings, but also a huge boost to grass production. And the cattle do, I mean, it ups the protein content of the, of the, their, the grass uh, or the pasture so they generally do better on that. Um, so it's also important to have the proper drill. It needs to have an agitator in it with that uh, fluffy seed and something that has good depth control so you don't get that seed in too deep. And then you need to be able to suppress the weeds after seeding. And that can be done with, with uh, sometimes with mowing or maybe light grazing or chemicals if you choose to go that route. Um, we've used a brilliant seeder uh, to plant some areas and we've used uh, double disc drill seeders. Uh, so it, it can be done with either, but um, you could even do frost seeding, although, you know, that's a little more challenging too. 
and it's probably going to, it's not cheap. It's going to probably cost you 150 to $200 an acre to establish um, uh, a good native pasture. Um, let's see, let's get through my notes here. Uh, I just also wanted to talk a little bit about uh, infrastructure. Um, go back to that previous slide if you don't mind. Yeah, so there you can see there's a, that, that fence line where it's divided there is a mile long. And uh, so I can tell you that the best return on an investment that we've ever gotten when it comes to equipment or infrastructure has been putting that money towards fencing and water systems. I have 10 water wells in use on this place. That's on 800 acres, 10 water wells. Half of those are for irrigation. The other half are for livestock and domestic use. I've got two uh, houses, uh, farmsteads on this place. But, um, and I've got about 15 miles of fences. And I've got 50 permanent year round watering sites. That's what makes this work. And people, you know, say, I can't afford to do all that, but they'll go out and buy a, you know, $100,000 tractor and not think anything about it. And I'm guaranteed, I'm, I promise you that this, that putting your money towards this stuff will pay off sooner than any piece of farm equipment you could ever possibly buy. And like I said, you can get cost share on all this stuff too, that basically pays for half of it, sometimes more. So I think that's a really important uh, point there. Um, okay, we can, well, we can just stay here for a minute. Uh, I just want to go through some of what I call the keys to our successful grazing of, of native perennials here on the farm. We take a holistic approach. Um, I've already mentioned how we, we, you know, the big thing is we eliminated fertilizing chemicals and that's helped us tremendously with soil health. We take soil samples all the time. We use the Haney test to, to look, you know, sort of uh, monitor our, our uh, soil health scores. Um, we've eliminated most all pharmaceuticals with the livestock, uh, exception being we do some vaccinations and we will treat an animal with antibiotics if they, if they need it. Um, but we're not using dewormers and porons and all that stuff that uh, affects uh, dung beetles and other beneficial insects. So we stay away from that stuff. Um, and the other thing is, you know, building a, building a forage chain so we can graze year around. That makes us much more profitable when we can do that. Um, the other thing is increasing stock density. And it doesn't have, you don't have to make tremendous increases, but just not letting them stay in the same place for the whole grazing season is is a big improvement if you can you got a pasture and you can divide it even into force you'll start to see results and you'll see results probably in the first year so modest increases can, can also work you know ohio state according to ohio state university they say that um uh you know an animal uh uh, the average cow produces 140 pounds of urine and manure in a day. Well, you want to spread that out just like you would if you're spreading fertilizer. And so just the manure distribution and the uh, better utilization you get from higher stock densities makes it much more profitable. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about our, our grazing plan. And I'm just going to tell you this uh, may not suit some of the experts, but I don't care. Uh, we, we're, we sort of have a non-prescriptive plan. With, we don't have rigid standards, you know, with any preconceived notions. Oh, you got to take half, leave half. You got to uh, start grazing when it's 24 inches tall and take it down and don't get below 12 inches or, you know, that's bad and this is not good and all that. Um, it's, ours is based on observation and what our goal is. In some places we graze pretty severely and other places we don't. Depends on, you know, a, a, lot, of, a lot of different factors. And we don't always, you know, rest everything for 45 days. Some places we, we graze once a year and rest it for, for almost a year. And other places we may be back in 35 days. Um, other times it might be 60 or 90 days. It, there's so many different factors 
um, you, you know, and, and that sort of is congruent with, with nature. I mean, nature loves chaos. I mean, when the bison grazed here and, and you know, several hundred years ago, we had bison, deer, elk, antelope, bighorn sheep grazing here, all in combinations. And, you know, they didn't just come in, graze the same spot every year at the same time for the same amount of time, same stock densities and, and make sure that they left when they, they took it down to 10 inches and, you know, and they moved on. So they didn't over, well, not overgraze, but just graze it too, too severely. Um, you know, there, it, there really isn't any such thing as overgrazing as long as you let it rest. And sometimes when we, you know, we try to do biomimicry, uh, we try to follow what nature has, has designed. And that doesn't mean we don't manage. It just means that we manage based on observations and pragmatism. I mean, it has to be, I mean, be practical for us and, and it has to, to work that way. And, 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 uh, so anyway, um, there's one point I, I kind of left out that I want to bring up is, is that when you talk about increasing your infrastructure with, with fences and watering systems, yeah, you might spend thousands of dollars to do that. But what the other thing is, is that it's allowed us to increase our carrying capacity or our stocking rates by at least 50%. In some places, in some instances, we've been on a year, we've been able to double that. Well, compare that with going out and buying twice as much land or 50% more land at today's prices. Uh, so it's much more feasible for most people to spend money on infrastructure rather than, um, you know, more land. I mean, if you were going out and investing in more land, why wouldn't you want to increase the stocking uh, capacity, stocking rates on that land as well? Um, you know, it's interesting because I like, think not the not to be too critical of farmers, but because I'm one. <laughs> but, you know, if, if I told you that I'm having a meeting and I'm going to show you how you can increase your corn yields by 50 percent, people would come out of the woodwork to come see what the, you know, what the reasoning is. But if I told you that you could do it with do the same thing with pasture, but you can't do it from the seat of a tractor, it doesn't gain that much interest. And I, that never made a lot of sense to me. But I think it's something that, that people should consider. Um, let's go to the next slide. This is really important. It's not something that I ever thought about until I started taking holistic management training about 22, three years ago. <laughs> and I had some really good mentors who were actually UN, University of Nebraska Extension agents. And uh, they that's the reason I started moving away from conventional farming, but they talked to me about the importance of maximizing the capture of sunlight and rainfall. Those are the two free inputs that you have out here. And a lot of times people ignore that. We get 24 inches of rainfall in my 24 inches of precipitation. About 10% of that usually comes in the form of snow and the rest of it in rain, but it's not about how much rain you get. It's about how much you retain on your land. And that's really important. Um, so this is an example of leaving some growth on these native pastures to catch the snow. Now see, we this was just taken last week. We had about who knows how much snow, um, seven or eight inches probably. It's hard to tell because the wind blew 60 miles an hour. And I mean, there's neighboring fields that I don't have photos of where they, it, snow blew clean off they'd done some fall tillage i mean there wasn't any snow any moisture left but on this field of mine with native pasture look at all the snow we, we captured um go to the next slide because this shows it two days later that's and the ground's not frozen now so i mean it's soaked right in and that's you know moisture that we'll utilize for for uh grazing later on or sometimes we do hay this this ground too we just we do rotational haying though we don't hay the same spots the same place every year so but that's another subject altogether but so retaining that moisture and then also if you've got the ground covered and once the temperatures start to increase 
uh, and we start to get some green growth, then we, you have to look at your land as being a, a giant sponge and a giant solar panel. So you want to collect as much solar energy as possible and collect as much moisture as possible. Now, we do have irrigation, you know, for a lot of our crops, but, you know, that's not cheap to apply that uh, either. So, but there's a lot of people around here that farm hills that are a lot steeper than this with corn and soybeans. And they probably lose half to three fourths of their moisture, but they just reapply it through the pivot. And, and, uh, but it's, it's very costly, but that certainly cuts down on our profit levels. But, you know, in a situation like this where you don't, where you're not irrigating, uh, then it's even more important to, to capture all of that, that moisture. Um, the other thing, you know, we're holding the, the soil, you know, how much is your topsoil worth? Cause this, we used to farm this when I was a young kid, we, we had corn on these Hills and uh, alfalfa and we, um, we farmed it and, and we got quite a bit of erosion. And then we put this back to grass about 40 years ago in this particular field. Um, so let's go to the next slide. It's just uh, more pictures of some of my native grass. And on the left side there, that's Indian grass. Um, in the middle, there's various different grasses. And go to the next slide. Uh, just more of the same, some close-ups. And, and you can graze that, you know, and, and in, in the wintertime, you graze that. People say, oh, you can't. That's, cattle can't survive on that because it's not low quality. Well, with a little bit of supplementation, like a little bit of alpha, phenom, a little bit of alfalfa a couple times a week, then do really well on that with the right kind of genetics. And we have the right kind. I mean, my cows have never seen a lick tub. They've never seen a feed truck. I mean, they're different genetics than what most people have. So they do pretty well on that, um, especially before they start lactating um, with a little bit of protein supplementation. And that's a lot, you know, better financially than, you know, cutting hay and feeding them hay or silage and all what most people do. Next slide. <laughs> the native grasses allow you to build resiliency. Uh, that slide on the left is, I think, from a place in Iowa. Uh, from a couple of years ago. Some of you remember that, but uh, you know, that corn is probably not coming back up and it's ruined. And the other slides are from my farm. Uh, we get some vicious storms rolling through here and the native grass always bounces back. Even if you get a hail storm, it, it comes back sometimes better than ever. Um, it takes some time, some rest, but if it blows over, it stands right back up in the next day. So there's a lot of resiliency, you know, that mother nature has uh, provided us through thousands of years of, of evolution uh, of designing these pastures. Next slide. This is the, the last slide. I just want, the point I wanna make, you know, my bachelor's degree was from Kansas State University in, in animal science and, and they were the first land, uh, first operational land grant university in the country. And their motto was ruled by obeying nature's laws. And I got to tell you, when I went through school, they didn't really apply that very much. I mean, it was all about inputs, you know, and pharmaceuticals and, you know, and, and but over the years, I've learned to get back to that. And I think it would behoove us, most of us in farming and ranching, to look at that premise and try to get back to that very basic, uh, those very basic laws of Mother Nature, because it's not only better for us, it's better for the environment, better for the land, better for the animals, and most importantly, it's more profitable. So that's all I have. Um, we can open it up for questions. Thank you so much, uh, Kevin. I'll uh, start off by uh, just saying again, for those of you uh, who have questions, toss them in the chat and uh, we'll get to them. This whole uh, webinar is being recorded and uh, will be uploaded to the PFI website along with the other winter webinars from this series. So if you have to hop out at one, uh, toss your question in, we might be able to get to it and then you can come back and, and watch the rest of the webinar another time. Uh, we'll start off here with uh, uh, 
Kevin, can you provide an example or two of how native pastures fit into your year-long forage chain? What percent of your grazed acreage is native pasture? Well, we graze every acre on this farm, but not every year. My native grass is about 50% of the farm. And that's a good, that's a great question. And I meant to make this point and it slipped past me, but um, those native warm season grasses, are they fit mostly into the, the summer slump. So the cool season grasses, you know, we, we try to graze hard in the, in April, May, uh, even into June, but July and August, they shut down when we get the hot temperatures and it doesn't matter how much irrigation you apply to a cool season pasture, they still shut down uh, and they get minimal growth. But those warm season grasses come on like gangbusters and they, it's my understanding they can produce about twice the tonnage with the same amount of moisture as cool season grasses. So, so we, we in July and August is when we, we graze those heavily and then we take, get them off and, and sometimes we get some regrowth and we'll graze them in the winter time. And, you know, like I said, the quality is not that great, but we, with some supplementation, it still works pretty good. And, and we try to leave some growth to catch snow, but, but we use them primarily for that summer slump. And that's going to be different, different areas of the country. I mean, they have a, uh, you know, warm season are going to be more important as you go farther South and less important as you, I mean, the window is going to be smaller as you go North. So Thank you. Um, what is speaking of your uh, grazing in the fall? What is your stocking density on native pastures in the fall? It, it varies, but uh, you know we try. We've grazed stock densities of uh, a lot of times from ten to fifty thousand pounds and and above with multiple daily moves. But when we get out on our native pastures, because you, as you saw that they're, they're pretty rough and stuff, a lot of times we're at three to five to six thousand. Uh, pounds of uh, stock density and and moving them maybe once a week and people say ah that's not that's you know that's not good you should be moving them at least every couple of days or and ideally you would but um you know we have to make it work from the standpoint there's a lot of limiting factors out here like fencing and labor labor is a big one i'm out here you know i'm retirement age and i'm out here doing this you know trying to make all this work and trying to uh like when i'm cultivating corn and or, or say soybeans that I've got contracted for huge prices on the organic markets, you know, I've got to, you know, focus on that and less on the, on the cattle side during that time period. So uh, it just depends on what we're grazing uh, in the fall. And we graze all kinds of different things in the fall, um, cover crops, crop residues with cover crops integrated and native pastures. Um, it, it just, it's, like I said, we don't have a set plan and I don't want a set plan. I want a plan. We do plan, but it's ad very adaptable depending on, you know, the num numbers of cattle, the weather um, and, and a lot of different factors. Uh, you say that's a adaptable. One question here is how many times a year can you graze warm season grasses? Well, it, it, again, it depends on how severely you graze them. I mean, some of them we graze once a year. Some of them we'll graze, uh, a lot of times we'll graze it twice, occasionally three times if we, if we moved them through fairly fast. And, um, and it, again, it depends on the weather. Uh, how long does the, the weather stay warm? And in Nebraska, like most Midwest, uh, the weather is highly variable. I mean, we've had, you know, very cool times in August. Usually it's really hot, but not always. It varies all the time. So one to three. What do you do for livestock shade? We don't have much for shade. We don't, it's not a, it's not really an issue for us. It's not something, there are a few trees out there. Uh, I prefer not to have shade because they, then they congregate around um those shade areas and they spend less time grazing and the manure gets deposited around those shade areas and you know we are at my farm's at 2200 to 2300 feet above sea level we get cool nights um and we have lower humidity than they do in a lot of places when you go south and east of here 
so it's not really an issue. Most people don't have shade in their pastures, and and you don't really want shade. And the, and the animals don't suffer. I mean, we try to use. I try. I try to stay away from black hided animals too. I think that helps. Uh, could you repeat the thirty percent legume and uh, commercial N application info? Yeah, and I think I don't have a. I don't have a link, but I'm pretty sure that was done by Michigan State University. 30% legumes in your forage mix is the equivalent of applying 200 pounds of commercial nitrogen in split applications throughout the grazing season. And we've, we've always incorporated legumes and tried to hit that 30% mix. And, you know, I can't tell you what we've never measured you know, the equivalent of in terms of nitrogen, but I can tell you that I don't, would never plant a pasture without incorporating legumes. And, you know, our bloat risk is, you know, is pretty minimal. When, you know, if you get higher than that, then obviously the bloat risk can increase. Um, and, but we've, I've grazed pure alfalfa stands uh, with, you know, several hundred head of cattle and strip grazed them and, and not had any cattle bloat. So, you know, you have to manage, you know, to try to avoid that. But sometimes, you know, things happen. On the topic of legumes, uh, what are some native warm season legumes that you like to see in your pastures? Um, that that uh, uh, lead plant, and that's, you don't see that very many places. Um, I don't see it on any of the neighboring lands or anything. Uh, there's certain uh, medics, different species of medic, M-E-D-I-C. Um, there's um, some clovers. I think Illinois bundle flower. I mean, not all those species are in this area, but they are in, you know, different places across the the uh, Midwest. But we, we've tried to use a lot of non-natives, like just alfalfa and different kinds of clover uh, and vetch too. Uh, like sicer milk vetch, um, what's it? Uh, oh, bird's foot trefoil, and some of those are native. Some of the trefoils, I, I believe, are native. They, um, lost my uh, sweet clover. Sweet, as you saw, sweet clover is the big one out here. I mean, and it because it grows so aggressively, and and people cuss it. I mean, some farmers and ranchers, I mean, they, they just cuss it. I mean, but, but they don't manage it. Um, and it's great for, for wildlife, but also beneficial insects. Uh, and it's great for increasing grass production and organic matter because it has a root system that goes down. And that's the other thing I didn't mention. Generally speaking, whatever growth you have above ground, you're going to have at least the equivalent or more of, of that mass in roots below the ground. So those grasses that you saw that were six, seven, eight foot tall. I mean, can you imagine the root system below ground? Um, and, and what that does as far as allowing for water infiltration, uh, soil organic matter, uh, and soil micro microorganisms. Uh, are you getting good dung beetle populations? Yeah, we have, you know, I don't, and I don't know why, but we, we don't, I don't ever see those big ones that roll the stuff up, but there's, I mean, there's literally hundreds of species of dung beetles. And so we do see a lot of dung beetles. I mean, it looks like the cow pies have been somebody sh took a shotgun and blasted them. I mean, like little, little holes all through the, through the cow pies. So we have those really shiny, metallic looking dung beetles in great numbers and i i'm not an expert on dung beetles i don't know what species those are but we have some different species but um someday i'd like to see one of those big ones that roll that stuff around but anyway we haven't used any of the you know all those dewormers and stuff for quite a few years and that's the other thing with the rotation of your livestock you get away from the need to, to do that and anytime you can keep an animal grazing you greatly improve the chances of them staying healthy grazing what they're designed 
to graze. I mean, grass and forages. Uh, do you, we've gotten a couple questions here about using fire to manage prairie grasses and have you ever used that? Yes, we have. Um, and the reason being um, with the, we've had, I don't know, numerous CRP contracts and some of them we had for 30 years. I mean, we had multiple CRP in the same place and the NRCS required you to do burning usually in the middle of that 10 year contract um, as a way. And it was beneficial. I, I will admit that, but as time went on, the NRCS started to give you the option of doing high, high stock density grazing instead of burning. So we took advantage of that. And in my opinion, in most situations, I think that has um, more advantages. Uh, there's a, on the topic of fire, have you used it for brush control or to keep smooth brome in check? Uh, specifically uh, or to direct grazing pressure even well there may have been some of those some of that when we burned the crp you know at the mid part of the of the contract uh, but we've never done it on our own we did it to fulfill the requirement and uh, we don't have high stock density eliminates most of those problems that you just you just mentioned um like I'll throw uh, mineral blocks in the middle of a, uh, you know, a brushy area where there's buck brush or uh, oh, I can't think of the name of that um, sumac. And, you know, and if you, if you let the cattle go without mineral for a week and then take them out and throw it there, I mean, they just come rushing in and, and they just knock the crap out of that stuff, you know? So, um, you know, you're not going to eliminate it totally. I mean, We've eliminated leafy spurge in places. We don't have a lot of it on my farm, but there's a lot of it in, in different areas. I mean, just with grazing. I mean, it, it's, I mean, the solution to most all of those problems that, that you have. And, and um, you know, and, and having some brush out here, some is, is not such a bad thing because, you know, it allows uh, its habitat for birds and, and different things. And, um, you know, we're at uh, one o'clock, I see. So uh, just a reminder for everyone who needs to hop off, toss your questions in the chat before you go, and we'll we'll try to get to them all here uh, as we continue. And, and thank you for joining us today. All right, another question uh, came in. Let's see. Oh, can you talk more specifically about how you suppress brome in your warm season grass pastures? We are also in Nebraska and have had a struggle keeping the brome in check. They use managed grazing, much like you, uh, variable stocking densities depending on objectives. Yeah, I mean, just early season grazing and grazing more severely than what maybe what the experts might recommend to really suppress that brome. And, you know, if you really want to do the best job, it might mean that you have more livestock during the early season and you may have to you, you know sell some of those or, or take them somewhere else um because uh, once you graze that brome severely and then and you're kind of waiting for the warm season to maybe start to come through and um you know you may run out of grass i guess so so that is a challenge i mean matching your your numbers with the forage and how do you know because some years I mean, last year, we didn't think we were going to have any grass to graze. People were selling cattle the first of May. I mean, and then all of a sudden, in about the third week of May, it started raining. And then all of a sudden, the grass exploded. And then we, we went from not thinking we we're going to have enough grass to, and we're pretty conservative on our numbers. We weren't going to, we, we, I thought I might have to sell half of my herd. And then pretty soon, we didn't, we needed twice as many cattle within about a month. So there's, that's what I was getting at. There's all those variables. And that's why I don't believe in a, you know, some kind of rigid, prescriptive grazing plan. Um, you know, maybe it works for some people, but it doesn't fit my style. And uh, um, because those variables and you, you don't know, I mean, rain, I mean, moisture is everything. It, 
I mean, so, but getting back to your question, yeah, I mean, it's just being able to knock that brome back and having enough, uh, you know, animal units to be able to do that. Um, Is there a time when you plan to defer a native prairie paddock for winter grazing versus during the summer slump period? If so, what motivated that decision? Well, sometimes it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of, I mean, some of it revolves around uh, just, you know, where you're at, where the cattle at in the rotation and, and uh, um, you know, how it's, the numbers are matching up with, with the resources you have and what cover crops we had and, and um, did we graze longer on those, but like that one photos of that uh, one um, uh, field of native grass, a lot of times we'll hay that in June and that takes off, you know, the brome and the cool season grasses and, and you get higher quality hay. And then that uh, um, warm season will come through like it did in those photos we use it to catch snow. Now we didn't do anything. We, we, we hayed that once last year, for example, and then we did not graze it. We just let it lay idle. Caught, it's catching snow, but we could go in and graze that now, but we probably won't. Um, but it's an option, but we really didn't need to because we already had enough over here on, and that's across the road. And it's just a little bit more of a hassle to, you know, for moving the cattle over there. And, um, so we didn't graze it, but some years we would hay it once and then come in and graze it in August and graze those. So it just depends on, you know, what our needs are, I guess. And every year is different. And we don't, like I said, we don't know how much rain we're going to get and how much regrowth. Um, but uh, in that field, because it was farmed at one time and was planted back, it's smooth. So we can hay that. I mean, as you saw in those, those rough hills we're not going to go out with any kind of equipment and start haying that i mean it's bad enough just getting around on a four-wheeler out there in a lot of those places so um so we're going to graze where we can't hay uh and uh and yeah but some years we'll use that uh, a second time in august maybe september and other years we won't graze it at all or we'll grow in go in now and graze it maybe not hay it this year and try to you know, take care of those, the cool season and, and then uh, see how it responds again, observational. I mean, we'll see. Uh, um, it's all about observation and adapting based on that. And, and uh, you know, and, and a lot of it, you know, back when I had sometimes four or five interns working out here and we had, we had, we were moving cattle sometimes, several times a day on, on that, especially on that irrigated pasture. And even in the, in the natives, we, we were able to put up more fencing, but fencing is a, even temporary fencing is a challenge in some of those big hills, as you might imagine. Uh, thank you for that. What time of year do you see the most success with establishing new native pastures? Do you have a problem with seed needing a vernalization period? Say that again, the last part is the seed what? Uh, do you have a problem with seeds needing a vernalization period? You know, I'm, a lot of that native grass was, when I, was planted when I was younger. And, and uh, you know, a lot of it was, some of it was planted in the fall and some of it was planted in the spring. Um, I think sometimes in the, in the fall, you get less weed pressure. Um, but then, because in, in the spring, you know, the weeds, uh, you're disrupting that ground and the weeds really kind of take take over. But there's been people that have had success planting pretty much, you know, all different times of the year. Um, so uh, I haven't reestablished any native grass in recent years. So, um, you know, most of that was done quite a few years ago. My biggest experience, my most experience in recent years is sort of rejuvenating existing native pastures and managing that. So uh, I don't know if I have a good answer for that question. I mean, I think that would be one for some of the experts on, uh, you know, maybe the range management people and, and 
uh, your NRCS and um, extension agents. Sure. Um, kind of in the vein of establishing uh, pasture, do you like to mix cool season legumes in your warm season pastures? Um, yeah, I think in order to get, uh, it depends on what, again, going back to what I talked about earlier, it depends on what your goal is and, and when you want to use that in your forage chain. So there's a lot of factors, but, but yeah, I like to, um, in certain situations and because it, it gives you a bigger window for, for quality grazing. Um, but you want to probably use cool season grasses that aren't going to um, be too invasive or, or, or take over like, you know, like brome, for example. And there's other kinds of brome, like, like metal brome we've used in, in pastures. And uh, if I was going to use brome, that would be one that I would use over smooth brome is just, I mean, we've never planted smooth brome, but I mean, it's everywhere out here, you know, all the road ditches and well, not all the road ditches, but a lot of them, you know, there's a lot of really nice native grass in, in, in road ditches in my area too. So, but. Uh, do you have any experience with gamma grass? Uh, no. Um, I have friends that do, and most of the, Gamma grass is south of here, south of Interstate 80. I'm north I-80, about 40 miles. Um, that's they say that's kind of the cutoff line where it, that it works really well. Um, but I think from what I've seen, it's a tremendous warm season grass um, if you're in the right area. And that goes back to the point I made earlier. It's like I mean, a lot of this stuff is so dependent on you know your geographics, um, where you're at, soil types, your climate, and that varies tremendously just across the state of Nebraska. So I know there's people on the webinar here probably from a lot of different states. So, um, you know, that's why I didn't talk too much about the specific species that I'm using because it's probably not gonna apply to anybody else unless they're, you know, within a 50 mile radius of where I'm at. Because even the Sand Hills in Nebraska has completely different, not completely different, but, but a lot of different species in their native pastures than we do and of course it's sandy there too um so you know that makes it all that makes a big difference do you have any problems with eastern red cedar or is intensive grazing the answer to that as well don't have a problem with it um a big problem with it yeah we, we get eastern red cedar trees coming up but but i'm one of those people that i never let them get higher than a knee high because every time I'm out there, I, I don't go anywhere without usually a spade or, um, you know, a little hand axe or even a pocket knife. And I, 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 I can pull out a lot of them, um, but I, I just whack them off. And it's the people that don't do anything that wait till they get, you know, three, four, five, six, ten feet tall. And then they pretty soon they have a forest out there. And then they're like, well, now what do we do? Uh, we got to either burn or go out there with a skid steer and create a huge mess you know, knocking them out and piling them up and burning them. I mean, I took care of red, Eastern Red Cedars on all 2,800 acres when I was younger. And the best time to do that is in uh, like February and March. The ground is frozen and the grass is brown and dry. And you can see those red cedars, even when they're six, eight, 10 inches tall, really well, you just go out and whack them off. And I just ride around on a four-wheeler, you know I mean? I've got one four wheeler. It's got 50,000 miles on it and several others. that got 20 or 30,000 miles on it. So I spent a lot of time on a four wheeler riding around pastures and it's all on farm use for those. Um, so, but that was one of the jobs I would do in the off season and take care of those red cedars. And they never, ever got to be a problem, but the cattle won't eat them. Um, you know, sheep, I mean, goats, you know, will to a certain extent, but so yeah, they're invasive and they're around and there's places around me that look like a forest because they didn't do anything, but it's not a problem. I don't consider it a problem. It's one of, it's one of my, at least one of my worries, you know, out here. Thank you. All right. I know there are still some folks watching. So if you've got any final questions, toss them in the chat. Otherwise, we just have one left here, which is in your opinion, Kevin, do you think policy can help producers diversify and make money? Uh, and if so, how? 
Oh, that's pretty. <laughs> yeah, I definitely think, you know, I've been involved in ag advocacy work for the last 20 years and heavily involved in policy and, and uh, centered around like the farm program and that kind of thing. Um, and I mentioned uh, one thing that that is, is a uh, example of how policy matters. When they did away with, uh, they repealed country of origin labeling, I had to make some major changes on my farm. And we moved away from, and I tore up all that uh, grassland in the, on the irrigated cropland um, that were as grass finishing cattle because that market uh, diminished greatly. Um, I was getting twice the price for my grass fed beef and selling by the truckloads uh, as commodity beef prices. And then, and now there's not that much of a premium. They, they bring it all in from, from South America and, you know, they were bringing that stuff in and label it product of the U.S. They bring it in and repackage it. And we got that stock just recently within the last couple of weeks. And I was part of that campaign. So, um, but I'm also a big proponent of, I'm not one of those guys that like, oh, uh, I don't believe in, you know, letting the USDA or NRCS. I've had good relationships with those people and they've cost shared on, I've had a lot of programs here and, and it's been beneficial, but they've all been conservation related. Uh, I think that, that that's what we should be moving towards rather than crop subsidy related, you know, for people to tear up more ground and plant more corn and soybeans to fuel ethanol plants and factory farms. Um, you know, that's my opinion. And somebody asked what my opinion was, so, so I'm not afraid to give it to you. But, um, but that's what we should be looking at because those things have been uh, environmental disasters. And I could show you all around out here, those uh, with, within a few miles of where I live, uh, those types of uh, uh, atrocities. So yeah, policy is, has a big influence on what we do out here. And, but at the same time, I don't let the, you know, the tail wag the dog. Um, so I don't chase that money, but if I'm going to do a project, it's like, well, I, this is what I'm going to do anyway. And the NRCS has a, a cost share program. that's going to let me do what I want to do anyway. I'm not opposed to, you know, to team them up with, with them and using that, but if they're going to make me do things in a way that I don't really think is, uh, is best for my operation, then I, then I won't. I mean, it's that simple. And the same way, you know, same way with organic, I mean, my organic systems plan allows me to do the things that, that I want to do anyway. Um, it's made me a better farmer. You know, people say, oh, that's a lot of hoops to jump through. Well, there's a lot of paperwork. I mean, yeah, but but I'm farming the way I want to. And I'm certified with USDA organic and, and also the real organic project on top of that. And and using some other beneficial programs that have uh, everything to do with policy. So, yeah, I think that there's a lot of things that could be helpful um, with changing farm policy that would make us better farmers and, and better food producers. A follow-up question here in the chat, which is uh, what would it take to get more of your neighbors to adopt your methods? Education, money, something else? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I'm the only organic farmer in my entire county, um, but there are other people that are doing, uh, have started to do more, you know, amp grazing, uh, rotational grazing and management intensive grazing, those kind of things over the years. Not a lot, but but some. And, you know, I think more education. I, I'm mentoring a young um, farmer that's neighbors, you know, land borders my land uh, through that here we back to the USDA top program. It's transition to organic producer program. I think is what it's, uh, anyway, they have a mentorship program where they, they team where they match up people like myself with young, not necessarily young, but farmers that are, uh, transitioning. So I'm partnered with this neighbor of mine. So there are neighbors that are, you know, watching what we're doing and, and other people in the community. And, um, but I think it boils down to, it's a combination. It's not any one thing. It's a combination of, farm policy um, and uh, um, uh, education. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of movement towards regenerative agriculture nowadays that, you know, I, 
you know, I didn't think I would see if you would have asked me 10 years ago um, or 50 or 20 years ago when we started moving this direction. Um, you know, we, there wasn't very many people that were talking about it or that interested. It's really um, snowballed. So, but I think it's a combination of different things. Um, but certainly, I think because, you know, we are in a business that there has to be, there always has to be financial incentives. And that's why I try to preach that, yeah, you can be a lot more profitable with regenerative practices. I mean, if, if you do it with the right approach. So, I mean, I mean, and if I say it's better for the land, it's better for the, for the animals, it's better for the consumer, it's better for your uh, bank account. I mean, what don't you like about that? I don't know. Um, better for your neighbors, better for your, you know, it's less stress. I mean, I, I, I'm not as stressed out farming 800 acres as some of these people that are farming 10,000 acres around me, you know, um, I don't think, I mean, cause they just run nonstop all the time. Anyway, I'm getting Thank you. Um, one final question here. Uh, would the same grazing uh, planting that you're doing apply to horses as well, you know? Well, yeah, I think, um, you know, I've only got a couple of horses, <laughs> so I, it's not like I'm real, uh, you know, and they're grazing. I mean, but yeah, I mean, they are grazing animals and, uh, so, yeah, I would say that there's, uh, I mean, there's differences. Obviously, horses aren't ruminant animals, but at the same time, they do really well on uh, native grasses. They do well on uh, even non-native, you know, cool season grasses and, and legumes and stuff. Um, but uh, so, yeah, I think most, most of this applies to them. Okay, thank you. That, that is all of the questions uh, we got. So uh, thank you to everyone who joined. And I, I echo all of the comments in the chat saying, Kevin, this was excellent. Thank you so much. Um, everyone appreciates your, oh, your no. thoughtful management and thoughtful presentation. Well, thank you. I appreciate um, the opportunity. And I invite everyone else back uh, for the next two uh, webinars as well. Same time next week and the week after. All right. Have a good rest of your week, everyone.